We started this series between Gale Force Esports and Team 12 saying, you know, probably going to be a confident, dominant win out of Team 12. So much so that Justin even said in his interview, I think this will be a pretty, you know, kind of confident, easy 3-0. Here we stand, game number five. It's about to unfold beforehand. I, 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 I'm still just struggling, you know, and just the, the, the idea that we were even in this position, Jay And how we got here. How, how we got here. It was literally two stops, like just... Absolute obliteration. Team 12 just destroyed Gale Force in the first two games. It looks like Gale Force didn't even want to play today. And then all of a sudden they're like, actually, we do. And it all started with Tomb of the Spider Queen, which was Team 12's map. And that's surprising to me because that is Gale Force's best map. So all of a sudden, Gale Force picked up that steam, picked up that momentum on that battleground. They're not letting it go. I mean, obviously, there was some back and forth in the early game of last game, but Team 12 was way far ahead. And all of a sudden, Gale Force, in a miracle ending there, just. I mean, destroyed, I guess, all hope yeah. of Team 12 closing out that game. And now we're here in Game 5. And when we look at Game 5s this year so far, Gale Force 1 and 2 in those clinching Game 5s. Team 12 1 and 1. So there's not really much favor going to either. So it c I'm curious to see how this is going to go. Yeah, I am curious as well. But first, we need to figure out where it's going to happen. Game 5, Team 12 will be sending us to Sky Temple. After Gale Force getting that victory, going with the map selection over the first pick. I hate to break it to you, Dreadnought. All right, break it to me. Jaina is 4-0 in the series. I know, big impact actually clutching it out even with the seven deaths, <laughs> still getting the win on Jaina. I was that, that's why I was trying Michael, to Michael, you had all zero deaths on the Junkrat last game and uh, was pretty effective himself. But again, you know, some of that hashtag worth for Biggie on, in some of those moments, so. Does Jaina show up here? That's the question, because you said in the last one, and I 100% agreed with you that in that, when your second pick and those first two picks that you get, Jaina's not normally the hero you want. Now we see Gale Force with first pick. They could pick it up in their 2 3 spot. Will Team 12 try and say, wait a minute, we want the Jaina? I, it's very curious here. Medivh being hovered here for GFE. Pretty much near 100% expect this one to be banned out. If we do see an adjustment, I think it'll be on the side of 12, and it'll be with that Maya letting it through, ban something else. We've seen them adjust with the Tyrael. Didn't work out on, I think that was Tomb, was the draft we got that from them. Maybe on Towers. It was on Towers, actually. Commit to the Medivh. How long on the Maya? Gale Force looked good with it yesterday when they got it in their first two games against No Tomorrow, and then it was same banned story. out directly after. Yeah, so we can't get three games of the same Gale Force. We have never been able to get that. This is the third game. This is where the flip you know, just goes, the, the switch just goes and gets flipped right here. They're only 3 0 this year Went on the winning side. It was against uh, No Tomorrow earlier in the year. I mean, I told you about the running joke me and Gilly used to have, right? About Gale Force Esports, like, you know, kind of behind the scenes. We wouldn't say this on broadcast too much. They will always take to you game five, and then game five, it will just kind of be a not what you expected from them. One, or the, one way or the other. It was almost <laughs> never getting that consistent one. They would get the game fives against series. You'd be like, how are they managing to do this? And then it was always when game five hit, normally they didn't somehow perform. It was the, the pressure, something like, kind of fell apart. This would be a big time win. The number two team here seated in North America. And then I think for them, I believe, you know, obviously we got to check a few things. It might pull them completely out of crucible range, which would solidify their spot kind of towards the playoffs. So we're not sure yet, but as you can see, Garrosh has been a big part of the success here for Gale Force, and so much so that they're going to first pick it. Not willing to commit to the support first pick, which to me shows especially with the lack of tracer between these two teams, you know, not wanting to commit to that. Because that is the only reason Malfurion fell into that slot. Not the only reason, a large reason Malfurion fell into that slot before is the synergies that he works with. Now that people feel like the supports are one-to-one, -one, that's not first pick priority, it's second pick priority. Interesting here to see this kind of unfold. I doubt it would continue through the rest of today, but love the inter, you know, kind of series meta between these teams. I want... I want Tyrael, I think, out of Team 12. I, I feel like getting Justin over on the Tyrael, getting a way to uh, kind of get that pressure out, expecting a support for sure. No, double down, screw it. I don't know how I feel about that, but I said that last time and it worked, so.
Hi, Jaina. Hi, Gear. Or hi, Tychus. Still. And that's ultimate single target blow up. I mean, you pepper them down with the bigger they are against the Garrosh, you get any type of follow up. But now, because of this dread, you mentioned the Tyrael. If you're going to get the Tyrael, it almost feels like you have to get something like a Blaze so you can make sure that both these heroes can get maximum value. Obviously, you get the slow from Jaina, but it feels like if you don't get the lockdown on a target, it's hard to blow up that. And if you literally spend everything into one kill and you don't get the lockdown, so will a tank with more CC or a secondary tank like a Blaze maybe even go down the route of an Arthas? Something to keep somebody in place to allow you to get those single target kills? Is that a, is that a factor if you do want to go down the Tyrael route? I think the biggest concern that I see with that is, like, I definitely agree with the lockdown sense, especially with the Tyrael that comes into play, is just the, you can assume a Malthale ban on Garrosh, uh, especially with that kind of one-shot capability abilities uh, coming in and then as we get the mouth tracer which oh man that provides a whole nother layer to a lot oh man so much to talk about but anyways uh is yeah i do think it does but it gets the blaze ban which it makes the uh or the mouth hail ban which makes the blaze that much more kind of incentivized which i feel like especially with the tracer picked up it's something i'd be looking to get rid of but now that we got tat we got mouth tracer coming in Tychus, one of the best to survive with it. Janus, not too shabby, can trade pretty well into the Tracer and definitely could be a uh, threat towards her. So pretty bold move here for Gale Force Esports. It just happened last week that we had uh, Justin go to Haymaker Playmaker on Meriden. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't double war triple warrior with BOE, but... You know. Yeah, you know, maybe. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing, too, is notice how there was no Stuka on Malfurion rotation. Uh, on the side of two, Team 12 and talking about how kind of bold that is. Normally, you'd look at those three on the side of Gale Force and say, how did you get all three of those, right? And that is because of that kind of bold move of the opening with the Garrosh, leaving the double support choke opportunity, and then Team 12 not willing to commit to it and kind of take that. And so this was, I wanted to say, you know, a bit of a bold move on the side of Team 12, but we're still yet to see if it kind of gets comes to light. I feel like if it, there is going to be that moment where it goes, ooh, where is, the, you know, this is struggling, it's very much going to be in these next two pickups from them. Also, Gale Force is not fully even committing to the support choke. Well, you mentioned the Tyrael. Tyrael does have the superior boss control, especially post-13, if you opt to go Holy Ground, plus the Sanctification on there. We'll see if there's any follow-up. Diablo, kind of the same thing with Apoc, but I really wonder if we... Obviously, Tychus, again, post-13, has Neo Steel. Post-10, he has Odin. Both supply armor. Relentless Soldier, if you really need it, if you fear you're going to get stunned. Jaina doesn't get that ice block until much later when she completes her quest. Will we potentially see an Uther to maybe deal with the Tracer? Can't believe you said the Uther word. You know, sometimes you take a break, you go have some water, you come back a little crazier. Yeah, I no, I, I, I understand. I, I feel like I do that more <laughs> often than not. Look at, the, look at the votes now. I mean, that was so heavily in favor of Team 12 throughout our first few games that now everybody is on the Gale Force train. I'll be honest. I know Fury's on Garrosh. I'm a little bit on the I'm a little bit on the Gale Force train right now. Just off that purely that sentence alone. Okay. What do we see from Team 12? This is I feel like a very important rotation for them. After such the bold move with the Jaina Tychus opener, they didn't get support choked. Do you even commit to the support? I feel like you do because you definitely want that last pick to be flexible. And if you want it to be flexible, I don't know. I'd say the offlane, but because there's no offlane priority, Gale Force gets the response. They go with the generic Dahaka, and there's that ETC we were talking about before. Haven't seen him in a while. I'd love to see a gray main here. You're going to have Biggie, most likely, on the Tracer. Get that Cursed Bullet. Maybe even pick up a Mouth Ale, which has been one of B Kid's most popular heroes. Get that big one shot kill, because if you can get the toss over on from Garrosh, get the stun or roots or the taunt in any form or fashion, get the Cursed Bullet, get the last rights. There's not a lot. And I think that's kind of the thing on the side of Team 12, is they're holding that support. If you do go down that route on the side of Gale Force, maybe that's when we finally see the Uther for that savior, but you also could step forward as Malfurion, get the Twilight Dream, and just kind of make sure everything goes right, see what Gale Force wants to do with it. This is one of the few games I think I'd like to see Gale Force even be willing to commit to a Tyrael offlaner. I don't know, man. This draft has gotten a little bit out of the norm on the side of Team 12, uh, now committing to a little, a little bit more data with the offlane and primary warrior. But Gale Force Esports, the amount of time that they're taking to commit to this, they do end up going down that blaze route we were talking about before, and then the Junkrat. 
I love Junkrat. Like, I'm on the Junkrat hype train, but I can't help but feel like he's been surprisingly prominent in the drafts for Gale Force today. He's been in all but one draft for Gale Force, and that's only because Team 12 picked it up early. Yeah, it was Well, no, it wasn't early. It was post the second ban. Okay. It was before it could make it back over to Gale Force. So it has been four out of the five games for Gale Force, for sure. What support? Now with the AoE poke of Junkrat, the isolation single target damage of Tracer. Do you want the armor? Do you go for it? You commit to it. I will say once I see the ETC, I go, I feel like in my head it's like, oh, this has to be the Uther. This is going to be the Uther. Divine Mosh opportunities are a little bit too threatening, even though you don't have to commit to the Mosh. Just it gets a lot more terrifying. And then also being able to make sure that Tychus, Tychus is one of the few targets we don't talk about. He's one of the best Divine Shield uh, people in the game. Whenever you use Odin, and if everybody's like, all in the Odin, he's like, I got armor. I keep myself alive <laughs> a little bit. Then you go Divine Shield, and he just goes, auto attack city. And you're just, if, if he never has to consider anything in any of the trades, Odin is still one of the, you know, best trading tools that absolutely exists heroic-wise or even not heroic-wise in Heroes. Just a little bit crazy that our draft priorities in this series, especially games four and five, have now had Jaina picked up very early in the draft in that slot. And the fact that we get Tychus Jaina immediately by Team 12 shows that their confidence is a little bit different. Their draft mentality is a little bit different, thinking that, look, the best way to counter you is to take away the heroes that you've been killing it on. So this is an interesting series, to say the least. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is game five, ready to kick it off on Sky Temple. In the blue, we have big impact there on the Tracer. Mike Udall is going to be playing that Junkrat. B-Kid on that off lane, repping that Blaze. Fury on the Warrior, always on that Garrosh. And Akaface playing the Malfurion. It's Gale Force Esports. And on the right side in red will be that of Dainsky. He's going to be on the Jane of this go around, trying to get a little bit of damage himself. Cure's going to be on the Tychus. We'll have Justin, of course, on the ETC. Goku is being on the Dahaka. And Bud's on the rare Uther pick here, trying to keep people alive against this Tracer. It's going to be good with the Tracer, a little bit less effective against that Junkrat. Biggest downside to Uther as a support is he is pretty poor with AoE healing, even if you try and spec into it with all your might. We saw some earlier laning setups that were a little less traditional from Gale Force earlier. Seems to be trying to do the same thing. Michael Udall going to use that concussion mine. Get himself to safety as, again, last game, zero deaths on that Junkrat in a very wild game that had lots of deaths. We still see Fury stay in that straw, but I'd like to see a really aggressive uh, bait onto Mike Udall over that kind of choke. They're just trying to get somebody to get overly aggressive, move into that area, and then just flip over the wall. It's a one shot, one kill. He's yet to kind of show himself, even though he is anchoring between the rotations of the two. He's going to be possible over this next wave if he decides into it. Well, you mentioned the one shot, one kill. We actually see the change up in his level one talent, not going into the groundbreaker quest instead going for the extra toss range so definitely looking to isolate somebody maybe get them back there we'll see a concussion mine potentially roots coming in maybe we'll get the vengeful roots uh, there from Akaface. so we'll see as this game unfolds at level four and then what they want to do obviously post level 10 to see if they can isolate and get that kill both teams going with the giant rotation at one minute in team 12 is going to go with the instant night rotation they do have global advantage so if they can find a way to get value out of that bottom camp in this top half then they could be in a pretty advantageous situation. But Gale Force had a far better response to this giant camp ro rotation towards the bottom half. Junkrat is allowing that with the superior wave player he had up in the middle half, and they're at least prepping this wave to get a little bit more value. That in mind, Gale Force did not make the snap rotation to an immediate night, so they might be a little bit late and a little bit slow to that. And it's been interesting the way that it, it continues to evolve. And I don't think there's one set thing that everybody's doing. We've actually seen some teams post the, the break that we had. They're trying to pick that up later, time that around that first temple phase. And they've kind of conceded a little bit. Although when we saw a team do that, I believe yesterday, they picked it up so late that they were actually late to the temples. And, and I can't remember where I saw that, whether it was in ours or in EU, but it just seemed like, all right, this is kind of our norm. I think we're going to change it up, but then it, it came back to bite them. 
see what they can manage to make happen. Concussion Mind knocking over that mage is going to make this wave a lot easier to get clear for Gale Force Esports. Nobody committing to the night camp yet. Garrosh did make the rotation up without showing himself through mid. Pulse Bomb gets sent out there from Biggie. No night camp rotation from Gale Force. Maybe they're just going to try and time it for the second phase, but the way the, the temples play out now, generally if you pick that up at the very early part of the game, the respawn timer, obviously a little bit longer on those nights, could potentially come back up before then. So we'll see if they have that priority and they just kind of sit on it for that second temple phase, which is kind of the old school classic way before we had our gameplay changes in 2018. Gale Force claiming mid shots. Team 12, top. Normally, if any team gains an upper hand here, it's going to be over kind of contesting for a long period of time over those shots and then making the rotation towards the top half. But Gale Force doesn't seem to be interested whatsoever. Justing, unable to make the rotation. It seems like both teams are very comfortable with this. You know, keep our offlaner getting the double soak, stick the four man together and don't sacrifice too much. In this time frame, there's a huge opportunity for Team 12 to be able to make a rotation towards that top four if it somehow did end up standing and Gale Force denied some of those shots. But Unable to do so, four ends up falling. We sit at a very passive game five. You can see that half fort remaining there on the side of team 12. So coming out ahead structurally as they go in, using that pulse bomb, obviously sitting on that charge for quite some time, can use it for a little bit quicker clear as you'll continue to stack up here just a little bit. Obviously finding opportunities early game a little bit few and far between. It's something I tracked quite a bit going into BlizzCon this past year is when are the pro players using that? And I timed every single one of them. And generally what you're looking at is as far as early pulse bombs, unless you're confirming a kill 100%, the usage of it in that first three to five minutes was maybe once on average. And I think a lot of times it can just be used more as a utility in the early part of the game as we saw Biggie use it. Gonna use that night camp, nice concussion mine. Gotta get the flip and toss on the Goku. Going into the shrub to try and get value out of the passive. Will he be able to get him far enough away? Goku getting tracked by Big E. And it's gonna be enough. Thought he might turn around for a dragon, that yeah. kind of choke. That's one of those moments where you get a big turnaround. Post seven with feeding frenzy. It makes that trade a lot more profitable for him. Commits and decides against it. As team 12 mirror the pressure on the bottom half. It's a significant amount because giving up that bottom lane, remember the second temple phase is that bottom. This is kind of that old school strategy of, you know, you start to do pressure in that bottom lane, you have the race towards 10, and you don't have that well if you're on the side of Gale Force in this instance. So now all of a sudden you don't have that well. The first few shots, if it does remain, those first few shots will take it down. And so you find yourself in a bad spot. Dansky. Oh, Great cleanse. cleanse. My goodness. That, uh, for, for anybody who didn't see it, once that oil ended up hitting, that was exact second that you saw the concussion mine being sent out there for Mike Udall. I don't think it would have gotten a perfect knock back into a kill 100%, but definitely would have been sent down, which would have made the distance to safety so much farther. Buds, though, saving the day. Baroques picked up. What do we see at 10s? Tracer needs to pick. Oh, Tracer ended up rotating down instead of just picking up a couple of those minions there, which will get him to 10. Instead, Gelforce is going to be a little bit behind, but you can see the rotation of Team 12 not exactly there yet. So Fury is going to hold point for now. Both teams picking up their heroics. Will we get a Tranquility? Will we get a Twilight Dream? One thing's for sure there might be a potential dance party because Mosh Pit was picked up. How many interrupts do we see for the Mosh Pit? You have Concussion Mine, Twilight Dream. Twilight Dream. Post 16, you can get a toss from Garrosh for yeah. the stun, but that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, you know, there aren't very many default ones to the point where I'd like to see them go into the Twilight to try and have another tool versus that Tranquility. Odin's going to be dropped. Ahaka coming in with a brush dock and force the Indomitable. Allows Fury to escape. Concussion Mine, not going to have that follow-up Groundbreaker from Fury. Water Elemental just zoning everybody out, but that's been taken down. Odin out as well. Oh. But there's the Marsh Pit. There's the cleanse directly onto that, setting up the big time kills. Shout outs there. But Dainsky, however, Biggie is going to get the takedown. So a two for one trade in favor of Team 12. But that pre cleanse by Buds was top notch, Dredd. It was absolutely top notch. And the reason they were able to open up that play, but look at how Gale Force is keeping themselves. They're so healthy. As long as Biggie doesn't get dragged and is able to kind of poke and prod around here. I think they might be able to contest this eventually. Justin ends up getting knocked over. From they have a pulse bomb mind. available. And look at Buds is pretty low. If Buds ends up dropping though, the three versus three is something that is huge ad advantage for Team 12, just because Uther can go into that kind of ghost form. Gale Force is going to pass, uh, play the more passive route. Go against it. 
Biggie will take the rotation back to mid as the shots consumed now by Team 12. We do end up getting the rest of the four on bottom. A little bit of work here towards middle as 13 Talentier soon to be picked up for Team 12. Nice taunt interrupts the power slide. Pulse Bomb goes down. And this is why we're talking about Fury on the Garrosh. The guy is an absolute playmaker. Now they're going to try and turn that play into a boss as Gilforce has their attention set here. See Garrosh manning the sidelines there, seeing if he can get a toss over, maybe into a boss stun. That's one thing that Team 12 has to be careful of. Instead, they're willing to concede here. This is one thing for Team 12. They still have a fort. So generally, the way this works, if it was going the other direction, that boss has a long way to go. So if you if you were Team 12 pushing with that, you'd have a lot more time to rotate up, do more in other lanes. But because the distance for that boss to actually do damage is much shorter, you don't buy as much time. You just buy the rotational control, which it seems like Gelforce is going to use that to move forward and take this mid fort. Yeah, and with this mid fort, they're going to kind of even the tides towards the structure disadvantage. Goku comes in with a brush stock. Nice into the fray. Going to keep Akaface alive a bit longer. There's the Indomitable. No root use yet for Akka. Twilight Dream gonna get that turnaround. Dainsky though hitting the slows, getting the drag. Look at that rip tire into the immediate taunt there from Gilforce Esports. Keeps Akka face alive. Now Cure into that Odin. Nice concussion mine splitting four members of Team 12. They try to get the kite out but Fury's having none of that. Pulling back Cure. Tossing him over into the team and the kill over to GFE. You know it started almost getting that initial kill. We saw another cleanse from Buds because the minute Daka came out of that bush, they were looking to lock him down. We saw a cleanse, he landed the drag. They almost got the kill to start that, but Gelforce was able to turn that fight. And again, Fury, Fury, and oh, by the way, more Fury. The guy is just disgusting on that warrior right now. Making the plays for Gelforce Esports. Five seconds out here from these altars, middle and bottom spawn. Neither team has too big of an advantage one way or the other. Definitely structural advantage for Gale Force, purely based on that middle fort. Prepping the bottom half. ETC is looking to get the collapse. That's a Garrosh by himself. If Jaina makes it, plus the brush talk, he's dead 100%. Nobody's coming down to help him. He's trying to buy himself some time. If he gets into the minions, he's not able to make it into the minions, so the tongue is going to land. That is going to be Garrosh going down. You know, we praise him so much, but uh, unable to be the indomitable force there. So we're gonna see the roots laid down, buying a little bit of time in terms of the rotations. Gonna allow Junkrat, who is post 13. As we've seen on Sky Temple, Junkrat post 13 has a little bit of mobility to kind of get around. I feel like that rotation, wait a minute, B-Kid. I guess he is a blaze, he'll be okay. I feel like that rotation and keeping the garage down below was purely because of the Haka threat and wondering which one of these shrines is Haka gonna go to. You wanna make you, you know, bring the fight maybe to that off lane. Big impact getting pressure with that pulse bomb on adjusting, but it does feel like that was uh, Gale Force expecting their opponent to make a mistake rather than maybe being the proactive one. Good job from Team 12 not taking the bait. Ends up getting them so much out of this shrine phase. Yeah, they did a really good job. You know, obviously, I think if Biggie was able to manage that kill against Justin on that ETC, there's a little bit of skirmish at the time around that boss, but obviously. He was able to get back to safety, and that bought them enough time to where they were able to capture both temples. And now, net themselves almost 16. They aren't 16 yet, though. And Gelforce is going to try and force cleanse from Buds. Cure is in a bad spot. Divine Shield has to be forced. That is a huge win for Gelforce Esports. That is a cooldown that they can reliably force a 16 into 16 without it being up, or at least 20 seconds without it being up. Now fairly even on the mini-map, although some keep walls have taken damage on both sides. We see a camp pushing in the top, which will need to be responded to. Gilforce and team just kind of hanging out, looking to see if they can find anybody pathing. The lanes are so far pushed out that they're just going to have to kind of casually wait for Team 12 to push things back towards them so they can obtain 16. But now with three members showing top lane, that shows a lot of information. Gilforce going to push in that bottom lane instantly. Damage onto the keep from wall. This means damage on to keep later on. 16's picked up. Justin unable to get a collapse. Maybe a big flank over that death bridge. Garrosh moves back up through. Justin questioning if he wants to get the collapse. He's going to make the positioning. Junkrat throwing down the mine, making that that much more difficult. Now Goku, he gets flipped over. He's got no tunnel. There goes the taunt. Pulse bomb. 
Damage isn't there, though. Garrosh falling low, just barely able to get inside that bunker, but he's going to be one shot when he comes out of it. There goes the heals, and the damage is there. Fury is out of here, but Dahaka is quick to follow up. There goes the mosh pit. going to be a bit of a whiff. Divine Shield, actually, or excuse me, not Divine Shield, but something came out a bit late with a heal attempt there. Two for one trade in favor of GFE. And they're not done. That concussion mine? Oh, he's going to get the snipe over the wall. Oh, oh my goodness. Gale Force Esports holds oh. on. You know, when he watches that replay, if he was holding on to a grenade, he did go infinite grenades, I believe, at 16, so, and he landed those last few. Which, uh, yeah, I think it's three, and it would lead to an immediate reset. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, you kind of wish you had eyes on everything, but it's almost impossible. The fact that he almost sniped that was still pretty cool. Right now, you know, Gale Force got themselves right back into this game, and now they're controlling this mid-temple. They can get a lot of shots here. I want to see how much of that camp is still left bottom because that obviously is going to be a mounting threat as there's another siege camp that was picked up in the bot lane. Going to force Dahaka's response. So if Gale Force gets the majority of this temple and then maybe rotate up to the top, I mean, we could be seeing Gale Force start to open this up. Mid-keep about to go down. Mid-keep will end up dropping with these shots. The bottom giant still left standing for Dahaka to try and rid of that in a clear. Now he's got a second giant rotation buys them a lot of time I mean, it's, it's all the time in the world. He can't move past the death bridge either because the point of flanking is so easy then from that point in Gale Force and without controlling eye, you don't have enough vision of the rotation. Three to four are gonna show themselves on the top half. That leads to Goku understanding he's got himself a free clear. Giving over vision he's is a in. bit of a risk. Look at Biggie, now B-Kid on an island, gonna hit the trap. See Justin going in, still 20 seconds away from the mosh pit. Goku, he's going to be displaced just a little bit. B-Kid eating a lot, going to put down the bunker. Odin's going to be out in response. The Rip Tire starting to give chase, though. Sure. See if he can get some damage in. Pulse Bomb as well as the Rip Tire, but so much armor is going to keep him alive. Instead, we got Justin in the backside. Divine Shield forced out to save him. I don't think that was forced to save him as much as it was the attempt to get a turn on in the mosh, but mosh was off cooldown for another five seconds. Yeah. That was not even an option, not even a possibility because the original interrupt that Gale Force got onto it set it to a soft reset of 10 seconds. Bot lane, Dread. Now that means those bottom giants that nobody cleared the risky brush stock where we were talking about before is going how much time that buys Gale Force Esports. By Gale Force winning that fight on top of it, winning the shots now, they have everything going for them, but the boss is the biggest threat. That glass grenade he did get vision that the boss has not been started yet. Look at Justin waiting on the side. He does have the mosh. He's going to go on to Fury. Good night. Wow. That's uh, an unfortunate misplay, not sniping that. I mean, you've got the grenades, and now that goes from a this might be a risky boss call just so we can get back into the game to now you're giving up the boss. My question is, how much does Team 12 try and force this? Because they're down. They're going to be down two keeps. I believe that top keep should fall. So now being down two keeps, plus having that bottom keep so low, your options of coming back are extremely limited. So I think, and with this exposed, Team 12 might have to go for the full push here to go straight to the core. I mean, I agree so much. That I'm surprised that Junkrat was the man to make the comeback here towards back towards the base rather than him being the split pusher and then leaving Blaze to come back. It's going to be a full four on four on bottom to Haka still. Worried about the middle lane, and again, that camp up on top that is eventually going to make its rotation in. Riptire comes in, just getting damage on the boss, pushing out those four members. Biggie uses blink number one. Justin moving up. Boss now making its way to the keep. Keep falling, 50%. This might be it. You can see the top and middle lanes on the side of Team 12 will be pushing. So if this drags on, Goku super low. The recall almost kills him. You can see the Twilight Dream does land on a Justin. B-Kid going in. Justin just able to make it out alive, but now with that, so much damage. Oh! The big blow up onto Jaina there. But with that, now all of a sudden, Team 12 has to tuck tail and run because their core is about to start taking damage. They need to get back quick. That is the second Divine Shield in a row we have seen be used on Justing, but no party, dance party, you know, to kind of back it up. But you got to be asking yourself why, and I'm going to put the answer at a short one word. It is Fury. The guy is constantly throwing around the ETC. Never has he been able to get that mosh pit off outside of that one situation where it was pre-cleansed. Garrosh was, in fact, a part of the original stun and then got the Divine Shield afterwards. It was on a soft reset once again, and then once ETC is that far out and out of position, it's just a mosh pit that goes, or a divine shield that goes, if we don't have mosh, we are not going to gain value. And it is the reason Gale Force find themselves ahead in this game. Structural advantage, they're going to have shot advantage, Catapult's making it from every lane possible, and still 12 seconds without that Jaina. Top shots, top shrine doesn't win this game, but it sets the core of Team 12 to so low. Like, I mean... Especially if this keep starts to... If this keep does go down, 
than the full channel, I think, would. It's close. It's like 10, 5, either it's way. It's super low at that point. So they've accomplished that, but it is a 5 on 5. Four Siege Gale Giants are down here. Yeah, the fact that Gale Force is staying not crazy, but a little bit. I mean, you if you lose this fight, it, you, it's you, the only you, way you lose the game. game. Yeah. Junkrat now going to the top. They don't have eyes on the Junkrat yet. They will see the channel momentarily. It will start ripping through the shields. I wonder, will Tahaka kind of panic, move forward, get that brush stock up early, maybe get out of position. Instead, he's actually going to be left in the bottom lane. Gil Force trying to end the game right now. Blaze, you see B-Kid putting down the oil, putting down, trying to get the dismount in any way possible, oh. slowing this down to get max Junkrat value. But Biggie is in the bottom trend. Yeah, he's actually in the one versus one with Goku on the core. Well, there's catapults mounting 94% and counting as the shots on top now going to be zoned off cure making it happen there justin now looking to get the control out 80 percent i was wondering why send biggie back just because he's one of the worst cores in the game but they're going to send they B Kid as well they got bunker 60. they're going in b kid's going to be here biggie puts down the pulse bomb he's got to get out of range of core which he finally does now minions are going to be there 40 percent falling he opts in the bunker he has the armor coming out of it. the fight's going to rage out of the top 20 percent all they got to do is get a few more shots they got they it. Do it gale force has done it the reverse sweep has happened here and Gale Force did it dramatically in about as crazy as a way as you could possibly do it. Take me back to T Towers of Doom. Take me to this game. That is insane. Gale Force Esports, the dream that never dies. <laughs> the team that consistency has been the thing that we talked about <laughs> the most over those two weeks of getting to commentate them so far at part number two of phase one. And I think it showed and about every single series from beginning to end. You have games where they're, that was the most competitive game I feel like they played. And I don't say that in a rude manner. I say that in a legitimately they are either dominating their opponents or they are getting dominated. There is very few that are in between. And that one, even towards the later stages, you know, getting that kind of out of the realm of control for Team 12. But Team 12, I mean, other than Tempo, which we only got a small glimpse of them last week, and we'll luckily enough get our first, you know, second glance at them after the series. But other than that, I just looked at them as far and above the rest of North America. And then we get this out of GFE. It, it, it raises so many questions. Look, it's a 2-0 weekend for Gale Force. And I, we have, like, our MVP thing, the, the HGC Minute, if you guys don't check that out. Obviously, it's a really good thing out there to kind of get a recap if you can't catch everything, but we also do an MVP section of that. If Yuri is not the MVP, I'm going to the Blizzard office. I'm having a talk with somebody. Cloak, in, cloak and like, I'm coming I, for you, buddy. I would have words, <laughs> Dude, is just you will not see a greater weekend performance, I think, from basically anybody. No, I, I mean, he he really did clutch it out for the squad. And I mean, I mean... I, I, we've talked a lot about Fury, but in that last game. So specifically, we had Mikey Doll on Junkrat constantly throughout that game. I want to say he had two big of highlights. Definitely no misplays uh, from beginning to end. A lot of the rip tires really well done, gained a lot of value, really good deterrent. Blaze in the last game, you know, I, the biggest thing for me is I feel like Aka face consistently on his Rhaegars, how many Ancestral Healings were hit at like 5, 10% yeah. HP, right? And then like the Twilight Dreams over the last game, the amount of threat they were able to get out. I don't know. It, it, we put a lot on Fury's shoulders here, and what I'm trying to say is every member of the squad was doing something uh, to make it work here for Gale Force Esports, but they do end up making the miracle happen. We have the captain, the man himself, Mike Udall here with us, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about that reverse sweep. Mike, I've got to ask, me, you know what? Just like, you know, what are, you, what are your thoughts? What are your feelings after that? The fact that you know, the reverse sweep of you guys last week and then coming into Team 12, the confidence that they had, and then to manage to get the reverse sweep against them, I mean, it's got to feel amazing. Yeah, I mean, it really does. Honestly, I'm, like, <laughs> kind of shaking. Uh, like, I haven't gotten that hyped about a match in a really long time. Like, we're all, like, screaming after we won that Towers of Doom game and, like, same with the last game. So uh, I, I contributed a lot of, like, the way that we practiced this week. I feel like, you know, when we got reverse sweep by Heroes Heart, they played really well. But we also had, like, a terrible week of practice, so I don't think mentally we were, like, really ready or there. I feel like this week, the reason we did so well is because we practiced really well. We had a good mentality. And, you know, after losing two games, we're like, we got it, guys. Just focus on just this one game, right? It's the best of one. That's it. It's all you focus on is one game at a time. So, ah, excited about it. <laughs> I gotta, sure. I've got to ask here, because uh, I, I kind of made the joke, but now that I make it uh, about you guys failing to 
It seems like we can't get three games of Gale Force Esports at the same Gale Force in a row. And debatably, you could argue today we got that through games three, four, <laughs> and five. But it feels like it's very difficult. The consistency, even within one series for you guys. Uh, uh, number one is, like, maybe do you kind of feel the same? And if you, if you do, could you maybe shed some light on, like, why you feel like your team kind of has that results? Like, that you can be, it seems like, maybe the best in North America to that kind of, you know, struggling at the lower end? Yeah, well, and I was just saying, I feel like we got four games today. I thought like we played really well in that Dragon Shire game, and I had a bad shot call at the end, right? Like telling Dahaka to kind of stay. I didn't expect them to do that well, and that that's on me. But I feel like a lot of the, we are very inconsistent, and I feel like a lot of that comes down to honestly practice. I feel like we we practice being inconsistent, right? So some games will be like super hyped and fired up, and everyone will be talking, communicating, and then the next games no one's really talking, right? So we're basically practicing to be inconsistent, and that's something that I feel like we really remedied this week, and that's why like I allude to practice. I mean, that's what it's all about. You need to practice. Like, how you're going to play. And this week, everyone was really dialed in and like tuned up every single game. And I feel like that's why we were able to rally is because, you know, we practice being consistent. We practice, you know, being down a couple levels and then coming back. So, so you're practice, saying man. it's just it's all about practice. You're talking about practice. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, that's it for me. I'm going to send you over to jail, man. Mike, first off, congratulations, man. But you talk about consistency. One thing that was consistent throughout this weekend was the play of Fury. And I think that he created a, basically a, a single-handed highlight reel throughout the weekend. What has it meant to have Fury back on your squad after him being away for so long and the play that we're seeing from somebody like that? I mean, it means a lot. I like I always valued Fury as a friend, and I'm happy to play with him again as a teammate. And I think that series shows why he's a beast, especially when he's on heroes like Garrosh. It's just... You know, I, I don't feel like anyone else compares. So I, I'm happy to have that on my team. I remember when I used to have to play against it when he was on tempo, it was the worst. It's like just Ban Garrosh, man. But <laughs> hey, I, Fury's been playing really well. And like props, you know, heads off, or hats off to him. I feel like he did really well. We talked about late game shot calling kind of being the, the end there of Dragonshire, but the late game shot calling there on Sky Temple was something unique and we haven't really seen before. You left the tracer. Who's making that call to make that? Like, look, we'll leave there and then we'll rotate B kit over on Blaze. We got this because of Bunker. <laughs> How does that evolve in the middle of the situation? Because we obviously saw you were using the four man to prep you going up to the temple, but to split back off like that, that takes guts, man. Yeah, I mean, so the original call was mine where I was like, Tracer, stay bottom, because Tracer can pressure the Dehawker really, really hard. Um, and then it's basically Garrosh, Mouth, Float. If they all come and, like, try to attack me top, then you guys come. I was afraid that they were just going to Dehawker Z and then four-man defend their core. But, you know, B-Kid's decision to peel off, that was kind of him. He saw an opportunity, he went for it, so that was really good. But I, you know, I feel like my late game shot calling has gotten a lot better. I mean, last week versus Heroes Hearth, like, the fact that we were in that game on Sky Temple... And I died at the end, right? That was me getting picked. But like, I actually feel like my shot calling late game has gone like so much better, uh, which makes me really happy. And I feel like a lot of that, again, comes down to practice where the whole team is communicating and letting me know what's happening the entire game. It's really easy to make shot calls when you know what's happening and it's really hard when everyone's silent and you're like, so like, are you pushing bother? Like, are, are people dying? So they've been doing really well. It's all the team, man. Well, speaking of the team, you guys have moved up. You're five and five now, and you've kind of moved out away from that bottom range, which means now you kind of have to set your sights more towards a playoff potential to kind of get to the midseason brawl. What kind of motivation is that for you and your team to maybe start having your eyes set a little bit different without the pressure of maybe dropping that, picking up the big 2-0 this weekend? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it relieves a lot of the pressure. I know b -Kid always jokes about the Crucible. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Is he joking? Is he not? But, but uh, I mean, I think that's something that, our team mentality is we all wanted to, you know, get informed for playoffs, right? Because it doesn't really, this week matters, right? But like how we're playing around playoffs is what really matters because you can like, make a run, right? So I, I think that's kind of our goal. Uh, like we really want to go to MSB. Uh, and I think that's something that our team does have a lot of potential to go if we just, you know, practice well and, and show up. So, you know, the back to back to back crucible dream may be dead, but well, that's okay because MSB is even better. You guys had back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back wins today for the reverse sweep, Mike. Congratulations, man. Yeah. Thank you. And Mike, uh, you know, I got to ask now, with so much focus on coming out from you guys' practice, and I, it feels like to me you're saying that if you practice like you play, it turns out it's a really good thing, and, you know, trying to yeah. take it to that level. Uh, but I just got to ask, you know, with moving forward with this series, not only looking towards LFM next week, but then also just in general, uh, what are kind of the intent and aspirations with that kind of mentality for the group that you feel like we're going to see that well-practiced, you know, controlled version of Gale Force Esports, or we can expect some bumps and bruises for a little bit of a while? I mean, I think it all depends. Like, it depends on how we rally from this win, right? Because it, it's much easier to rally from a loss where everyone's like, okay, we need to buckle down and we need to do stuff. But, like, coming out of a win, it's normally 
ah, we did so great, high fives all around. You know, everyone's like patting each other on the back, but like you need to have that same intensity and same mentality come Monday. So, uh, I mean, I hope we see it. Like I, that's, I'm, I can only control me, right? And every player can only control themselves. So like, I expect to see it. I think like we've talked a lot about playoffs. We're getting reverse sweep by Heroes Hearth really gave us a kick in the ass. You know, like we realized that we need to do a lot better and we need to practice a lot better. So I hope to see it continue, but like then again, it's it's everyone's individual decision, and you know I have confidence in my teammates, so I'm I'm excited, man. I, I'm excited as well, and uh, <laughs> you know I, thank you for the insights and kind of providing some of the perspective. That's gonna be it from us. Uh, you got any shout-outs or anything alike? Yeah, I just want to shout out my mom. She's pretty cool. But yeah, no shout out to all the fans. Shout outs to my teammates. Uh, thank you, Gunners, all our sponsors. If you guys want to check out some streams, DJ B Kid. It's B Kids too, and then I don't really stream anymore, so it's just B Kid. Go give him some love. B Kid interview in the chat. Bless RNG, you know. Bye. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Gale Force.